Okay. Um, thanks very much. Uh, brilliant, isn't it? George. Be more George. That's just, that was superb. Um, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. It's, um, I hope it's going. You don't have to answer that question, but I'm just, I hope that you're enjoying it because I'm in deep trouble if you're not. We're delighted um, to have with us once again the Chief Exec um, of NHS England, whom we'll welcome to the stage shortly. A year ago, um, when I was stood on this stage in Liverpool, uh, about to introduce Amanda, uh, a key theme was on NHS recovery in the work of the pan pandemic. And since then, we've had one of the most intense winters ever. Right? Um, we've endured over six months of industrial action. But we've got a lot to be optimistic about. I always say to people in rooms like this, you're far too lucky to be pessimistic, to be honest. We've got some indications, the waiting list coming down, operational performance improving, and a shift towards a more mature NHS operating model uh, that's beginning to get local leaders leading. Together, we're still on this journey. I, sim I said something about this in my speech, but this is progress towards a, a more collabor collaborative effort between all of you here, the systems and organisations you work for, and the national leadership that's needed. In fact, it's essential. In this context, I'm, we are really grateful that Amanda can make the time to join us uh, for the morning of our conference, deliver a keynote address to you all. I'm hoping, in fact, I'm assured there'll be time for questions after a speech. Um, and please submit, ensure that you can submit your questions via Slido on the Conference Expo app. Get involved on the social media and all that stuff, hashtag this, hashtag that. But without any further ado, please um, give a warm welcome to Amanda Pritchard. Thank you very much indeed. And Wow, George is a tough act to follow, isn't he? A bona fide star of stage, screen, the written word, and of course, as we saw, the Strictly dance floor. George, we are so privileged to have had you here with us today and to hear your powerful message. Let's all just show again our appreciation for George. We all wish, of course, that more of our colleagues could have been here today to hear George's message as well as to contribute to the important discussions that are planned across the programme. On behalf of my NHS England colleagues who can't make it, Steve Powers, Ruth May, David Sloman, Vinda Walker, among many others, I just want to give my apologies for the unavoidable disruption to the schedule. Um, and speaking personally, I wish I could stay longer, but sadly, I need to get uh, straight back to the office after this, having already done incident management calls remotely this morning. And of course, I know you understand that as valuable as this time is to connect and share and learn together, we must prioritise the management of what is a serious business continuity incident and therefore a serious risk to patient safety. So once again, we're heading into this period of industrial action against a backdrop of rising pressures. So as regrettable as it is that so many colleagues won't be able to be here this week, let's also just show our appreciation for those who are once again working tirelessly to maintain vital services. However you feel about the rights and wrongs of industrial action in the NHS, our number one priority must be patient care and patient safety, both in the immediate window of action and in the longer term too, because as much as we learn from managing each action every time it happens, it creates risk, it creates upheaval, and it distracts from our priorities, particularly elective recovery. 
as you know, over half a million appointments have already had to be rescheduled, and many of those patients, uh, many of those people will have been waiting months. It's likely we'll see tens of thousands more affected this week. So while the NHS will, of course, expertly manage the incident to the best of our collective ability, I know we all hope for a resolution soon. I would also just like to say a particular thanks to the ambulance crews and other NHS and emergency services staff who responded to the appalling tragedy in Nottingham yesterday. Our thoughts and sympathies are with those killed and injured along with their friends and loved ones. This terrible incident was just another reminder of the bravery of paramedics and other blue light staff who can never know what they're going to be confronted with when they leave their home, leave their loved ones and clock on for their shift. As I've said, unfortunately, I can't stay for long at the conference this year, but I do know that part of my job uh, in being here with you today uh, is to try and fire you up at least for the next 30 hours or so that are ahead because you also have important work to do here. Every part of this program, every idea you pick up or share, every connection you make has the potential to lead to improvements in care and services for patients. And that's why we are all here. So let's get to work. As you know, we are approaching the 75th anniversary of the NHS and big anniversaries always give us cause to look back and reflect on milestones past. So yesterday I visited Trafford General Hospital, literally just a few miles from here to do just that. Now, many of you will know why that site holds such a special place in NHS history. But for those of you who don't, it was the hospital where Nye Bevan launched the new National Health Service on the 5th of July, 1948. At the time, Park Hospital, Davy Hume, as it was called then, was the most modern hospital in the area. But it hadn't just opened that day. Of course, it had its own history, going back to the 20s, and even for 13-year-old Sylvia Beckenham, the girl in the pictures with Bevan, presented as that very first NHS patient. Well, no doubt, a day she would remember for the rest of her life. In truth, in terms of her medical care, at least, it was no different to the previous days that she'd been in that same bed being treated for acute liver disease. I know many of you will be looking forward to hearing from Anaira Thomas later today. I had the pleasure of meeting her in London a couple of weeks ago, and she has a great story about how she came to be the first baby to be born in the NHS in Wales. So I won't ruin that story for you now. But even for Anaira and her mum, Edna, aside from the added significance of that birth that everyone involved felt, largely their medical treatment would have been the same as a baby born in that same hospital a day, a week, a year before. So while it was a momentous occasion, as Bevan said to Sylvia, a milestone in history, the most civilised step any country had ever taken, we would be wrong to say that on the stroke of midnight, on the 5th of July 1948, the standard of healthcare in our country was suddenly transformed. There were still huge challenges to overcome. There were just 10,000 doctors and 60,000 nurses working in English hospitals, serving a population of around 40 million. GPs were, in many cases, working out of the front room of their houses, and of course, the pent-up need for care was huge. All massive challenges, and many more besides. But the wheels were turning. They were turning, and they have continued turning for the last 75 years. And at any point in that 75-year history, if you'd have stood still and looked, if you'd taken a snapshot, you'd be forgiven for not having seen that momentum. But look back over the arc of time, and the picture becomes clearer milestone after milestone, achievement after achievement. In many cases, not just leading the world in equity of access, but in game-changing innovations too. The first 
modern hip replacement, the first CT scan, the first combined heart and lung transplant, the first baby born after IVF just 10 miles from here at Royal Oldham, the first heart surgery carried out by a remote controlled robot, and of course, the world's first COVID vaccine delivered outside a trial. An, am an amazing history, but never a static one. If I look back just over the course of my own adult life, the story is the same. In the 1990s, we had wards full of patients with HIV and AIDS and deaths climbing towards 2,000 a year. Now, we have the prospect of being the first country in the world to end new HIV transmissions. Back then, hep C infections were still on the rise. Now, again, there's a real opportunity for us, thanks to a groundbreaking find and cure partnership with industry and charities, that we could have a real shot at being the first country to eliminate the virus as a public health concern. Infant mortality has halved. So have death rates from heart and circulatory diseases, thanks in part to effective identification and cheap treatment. Breast screening in its infancy then now saves 1,300 lives a year. And thanks to being one of the first countries in the world to deliver mass HPV vaccinations combined with our screening program, we can also see a path to eradicating cervical cancer, which still killed scores of young women every year at the turn of the century. In the 1990s, it was taking teams of hundreds of scientists across the globe months and years to put together fragments of genetic sequence. Now the NHS can provide whole genome sequencing to every infant in intensive care, giving clinicians the ability to check for over 6,000 rare diseases in days so they can deliver the right treatment fast. Surgery is a major life event for most, meaning days in hospital, extensive scarring, long recovery times. Now, up to 75% is carried out through day surgery. And we increasingly use robots and other techniques to deliver safer and more effective procedures. Home computers were still for the few. The internet was home to less than 10,000 websites. And mobile phones, if you have one, were the size of handbags. Now, the NHS app allows patients to access their medical records, order prescriptions, make appointments, seek personalised health information and support with many more developments in the works. Look, you get my point. But as we have consistently seen, as challenges subside or are beaten back by advances in practice or science, new ones emerge. In some cases, that's precisely, it's precisely because of our success uh, that new pressures are created. Nowhere is that more evident than in our aging population. Life expectancy has increased by well over 13 years since the NHS was formed. That is real, meaningful progress. But what it means, of course, also, is more people needing medical care, often for multiple conditions at the same time. It also means more people needing social care, and we're all well-versed by now in how capacity in social care has a direct impact on people's lives, as well as on the NHS. So just like in 1948, uh, just like in any year you'd care to choose in the last 75, we know the NHS faces challenges now. They're different challenges, but they are challenges nonetheless. I talked about many of them at this conference last year. You may remember, um, Victor's just referred to it, my four R's. But even looking back just over the last year, a mere sliver of the history of the NHS we see important progress. So I talked about the need to see recovery of key services because of the inevitable impact of COVID, and you delivered. In elective care, we've seen the number of people waiting for 78 weeks or longer fall by 90% from its peak by March, despite the severe winter pressures we experienced and the disruption from industrial action. On diagnostics, you have delivered a million and a half more scans and tests over the last 12 months, helped by our growing number of community diagnostic centres, which have now contributed more than 4 million 
additional scans and tests in total. In cancer services, the number of people seen for urgent checks continues to break records, now double what they were a decade ago. And that means we're catching more cancers at stage one and stage two when they're easier to treat than ever before. And cancer deaths are 10% lower than just five years ago. In urgent and emergency care, ambulance uh, response times have improved across every measure. And we saw very promising improvements in A&E performance after we published our recovery plan. Although I do know, of course, that in recent days there have been uh, real pressures on urgent emergency care systems, uh, not least because of the heat and the unexpected uh, and the unexpected combination of that with increased, uh, with increased demands because of now uh, industrial action as well. In primary care, so far in 2023, GP teams have delivered around 2 million more appointments a month than last year, with 7 out of 10 of them being face-to-face -face and still more than half being same or next day. In community services, you delivered our target for two-hour urgent community response teams early, with more than four out of five patients referred, benefiting from a fast response to assessing and meeting their needs. In mental health, you have supported record numbers of children and young people, rolling out school-based teams ahead of time. Record numbers of adults with serious mental illnesses are being treated too and record numbers of new mums as our perinatal mental health teams continue to go from strength to strength. And in learning disabilities, you've supported more people to live well in the community, with discharges from hospital up 6% year on year and a significant increase in annual health checks. When I spoke of my second R, the need to reform for the future. I spoke of the immediate opportunity in front of us to grasp the benefits of integration, and you delivered. Locally, ICSs are not just words in a statute book. They've become a way of working. They've been central to some of that progress I just described, the rapid deployment of system control centres to better manage winter pressures, a case in point. Nationally, we've brought together NHS England, NHS Digital and Health Education England to create a new organisation, one that's better able to support the wider NHS in a coherent, coordinated way. And crucially, we have co-created our new operating framework, bringing shared understanding to how we all work together. That framework will, of course, continue to be iterated, particularly thinking now about how we take forward the recommendations from the Hewitt Review. I talked about the need to harness the potential of technology and data, and you have delivered. Every ICS now has a shared care record in place. We're within touching distance of nine out of 10 trusts having electronic patient records in place, and we've supported more than half of all adult social care settings to adopt digital social care records. And I spoke of the need to continue to work with innovators, researchers, and the life sciences sector to support the development of new technologies and, crucially, to ensure NHS patients are at the front of the global queue to benefit from those which are effective. Here, too, you have delivered. The NHS Genomic Medicine Service has continued to expand the number of tests available. The NHS Galeri trial has exceeded patient recruitment targets and is showing real promise and being able to spot early signs of dozens of cancers. Our Be Part of Research partnership has recruited an additional 150,000 participants, including 108,000 who've registered via the NHS app. And our Clinical Entrepreneurship Programme has now surpassed 1,000 innovators being supported to develop and spread promising new products. And all of that without mentioning the dozens of new treatment options now available to patients that weren't last year, thanks in no small part to our ability to get the best deals for taxpayers. My third R, many of you might remember, was resilience, ensuring the NHS can meet future pressures. Central to that, I talked about the need to, to boost workforce numbers, and again, you have delivered. 
The latest provisional figures for March show 20,000 more clinicians in our hospitals and community services compared with the same month last year, topping 671,000 for the first time. And in primary care, we've surpassed our target to recruit 26,000 additional roles a year early. On the other side of the coin, I talked about the need to right-size our physical capacity too, and you delivered with over 2,500 more general and acute beds open at the end of March this year compared to last, supplemented by a huge increase in virtual ward capacity, now supporting thousands of patients at home every week. And my final R, no less important, respect. Firstly, respect for our staff. And I won't gloss over the really challenging findings of the staff survey or how industrial action is straining relationships locally. But we are taking action and we are delivering results. Since we launched the national retention programme in April last year, lever rates have improved uh, across the board. But in the 23 exemplar sites, the improvement has been double the average for staff, including, uh, including nurses giving us a solid foundation of learning we can now spread across the country. Our continued focus on improving the representation of colleagues from ethnic minority backgrounds is also paying off. Windrush 75 is a reminder the NHS has always benefited from the skill and dedication of colleagues from overseas, something that historically hasn't been reflected in the senior positions across the health service. But we are improving. The latest reports show more nurses from ethnic minority backgrounds are progressing from band five into more senior roles, including chief nurses and midwives. And now over a quarter of our clinical directors and a fifth of our medical directors are from an ethnic minority. Of course, it's not enough that people stay in the NHS. We need them to stay well too. We learned a lot about addressing health and well-being during the pandemic, but we need to move to prevention rather than just helping people when they need it. So more than 200 well-being guardians are now in place in local trusts. And in July, we launched Growing Occupational Health and Well-Being Together, which is our new five-year program supporting employers to develop proactive support offers. I also talked about respect for patients, specifically the need to roll back visiting restrictions put in place to save lives over the pandemic so people now uh, could move to being able to see their loved ones, which makes such a massive difference both to experience and quality of care. And you delivered that too. Finally, I talked about respect for the public's investment in the NHS. And once again, you delivered. With the NHS in England living within its means despite the real pressure on budgets caused by inflation, and in doing so, delivering more than five billion pounds of efficiencies. All achievements we could be proud of in the best of times. To achieve them in the toughest of times shows just what the NHS and what its staff are capable of. To paraphrase Nye Bevan, speaking during the third reading of the National Health Service Bill back in 1946, we may discuss these things here, but we do so in the knowledge that it is people outside this room, people including you, who make them a living reality, who give them meaning for those they need to mean something to. So thank you for your sustained effort and for making a real difference for patients. None of us would say the job is done in any of the areas I've just touched on. We all know there is still lots more work to do, and that work is really hard, but we are moving forwards. The wheels are turning, and there is nothing inevitable about that. It is because of your hard work. History tells us that our path has always been an uphill one. Our course has always had an element of uncertainty. The ground has always been uneven. And because of that, progress has sometimes been faster, sometimes slower. So our role, just as it was uh, the case for those who came before us, can't be limited uh, to providing the force to maintain momentum, although we have shown time and time again how effective we are at doing that, particularly when the going is toughest. It must also be in providing the vision 
in surveying the landscape and identifying the ditches and the divots that threaten our progress and equally the tools and techniques at our disposal so we can steer the best course. Sometimes that horizon has to be two months, two weeks, maybe even two days ahead as we did during the height of the pandemic. Lots of times the horizon might be one, two, three years in the future. And that's the, where we've been recently in addressing the recovery challenge. But the greatest gains come from looking beyond to a further horizon. When you do that, the picture is less clear, the breadth of the horizon is larger. So surveying and sense making is best done collectively. And thanks to the NHS Assembly, that's what you've been doing. Over the last couple of months, their call for views has gathered hundreds of individual submissions, taken in feedback gathered by scores of local leaders and delivered in-depth engagement with patients, carers and clinicians. All told, the voices and experiences of hundreds of thousands of people have been brought to bear. And I want to thank everyone who responded to the Assembly's call and all those who've given their time to lead it. So it felt fitting yesterday as I was uh, reliving our shared past at Trafford General to hear from members of the Assembly about what they'd learned from you. It was no surprise that just like public surveys consistently find, you have great pride in what the NHS stands for and the things colleagues have achieved, not just in the past, but every day. And importantly, despite the significant challenges we've faced together over the last two years, uh, two years, few years, I should say, you are optimistic about the future and the opportunities that exist to improve care and outcomes. But you are also mindful of the fact that if we're going to take those opportunities, if we're going to build a bridge to that future, we need to ensure the foundations that bridge sits upon are as strong as they can be. I have to say that strikes a real chord with me and echoes conversations we've been having and work we've been doing nationally. So I want to just focus in on a few of those now. Uh, innovation, improving quality, prevention, and of course workforce. So taking innovation first, as I described earlier, a key part of the history of the NHS, uh, innovation has to be central to our future too. The sheer scale and pace of possibility means we have to take a deliberate approach, focusing on those things that will deliver the biggest impact and making sure we've got the right foundations to be able to seize those opportunities. So look, if we take technology and data, getting the foundations in place means completing the work to roll out EPRs and making sure we've got the right data architecture, which we're, going, uh, which we're doing uh, because we're in the process now of going through uh, the procurement for the federated data platform. If we can do that right, then we can put ourselves in the best possible position to benefit from innovations like artificial intelligence, benefits we're already beginning to see. So in stroke care, for example, AI is already in use in uh, more than four out of five stroke networks, helping clinicians to reduce the time to deliver effective treatment by an hour tripling the number of stroke patients recovering with no or only slight disability from one in six to just under half. And in cancer, we're rolling out AI teledermatology capability, which can predict with 99.7% accuracy whether a skin lesion is likely to be cancerous or not, speeding up diagnosis and treatment for patients. Far more applications are on the horizon. Applications that have the potential to free up clinicians' time, give them faster access to test results, and provide new forms of support for many patients. And as a national health service, we're in a prime position to be able to make this technology available quickly. And our national commercial powers make us well-placed to get the best deal for taxpayers. I think it's a similar story when we think about life sciences. I've spoken already about the proud history of incubating and making available new tests and treatments, a history that we continued during the pandemic with the discovery of the benefits of dexamethasone and one that we still continue now. So for every four treatments available in Europe, there is an additional one available in England, including medicines for rare and complex conditions. A review of 222 new medicines showed the UK was third globally in the number of medicines commercialised within a year 
of their first approval. And a more recent industry review places third in the G20 for access to new treatments. Do we demand a fair price for taxpayers? Yes, we do. But do we deliver for patients? Yes, we do. And we want to continue doing that in a spirit of partnership with the life sciences industry, the kind of partnership that's given patients access to the Galeri trial I mentioned earlier, and the kind of partnership we're entering into on cancer vaccines, a shared quest to realize the potential of mRNA technology to teach our own bodies to fight cancers and other killer diseases. We know there will be other potentially game-changing tests and treatments coming down the line. And we want to make sure the NHS is in a prime position to take the opportunities they bring. So that's why earlier this year, I asked Roland Sinker to lead an action-focused piece of work together with industry, academia, the NHS, and patient groups to ensure that we can prioritize the biggest improvements and improve, uh, to improve care, to help develop them and ensure as many people as possible benefit. That's the work that will enable us to continue to be a world leader, continue to make the kind of difference that I heard about recently when I met Ruben Tanaka and his parents. Ruben was seriously unwell from birth. At just five days old, he was vomiting. His mum, Eleanor, was unable to feed him. His family had to travel from Cheltenham to Bristol so he could receive intensive care. It was obviously an incredibly worrying time for the family. Initial investigations found he had high levels of ammonia but, uh, in his blood, but couldn't pinpoint a cause. Uh, thanks to the fact that the NHS provides whole genome sequencing, his care team were able to narrow it down, meaning they could give him the right treatment to save his life without the need for a dangerous liver biopsy. And now, thanks to that treatment, he's been able to have a liver transplant which means all being well, he has many healthy years ahead of him. Making more stories like Ruben's for patients at all stages of their lives is why we have to set ourselves up to take the opportunities that science and technology will present. Of course, it is not always about innovation. In fact, most often improving outcomes is about iteration and it's about improvement. That's true in everything the NHS does, but it's most important when we think about quality of care. It's a question we ask ourselves, I know you will ask yourselves every day, how can we do this better for patients? Because as good as our care is in historical terms, even at best, it can always be better. We know that's true in maternity services. Most women continue to have good experiences and safe births, but for as long as some don't, we have work to do to improve, and particularly in those trusts where we know the most significant challenges lie. So a priority for our new Chief Midwifer Midwifery Officer, Kate Brintworth, will be leading with Ruth May and others further intensive work with families, clinicians, and local leaders to support our maternity workforce to deliver the best care possible for women and babies. But we're equally determined to do our best in every area, whether locally, that means tackling waiting lists, bringing down ambulance waits, or increasing access to primary care. So that's why earlier this year, we launched NHS Improving Patient Care Together, or NHS Impact for short, and by creating a new single shared NHS improvement approach, one that's built on the best evidence and practice from what you are already doing. We're working to drive the delivery and continuous improvement of care for everyone. And to lead this work, we're launching a national improvement board, bringing together executives, directors, clinical leaders, and improvement experts to support local leaders to improve care for their local populations. I know from the conversations we've had with ICB and trust leaders just how much enthusiasm there is for this work. So I'm really looking forward to working with you all on it. Another thing that came through strongly in your response to the Assembly's call was the opportunity to give people greater uh, control, greater opportunity uh, to take, uh, take control of their own health and hopefully, therefore, uh, avoid the onset or progression of disease. So, look, that is 
absolutely the right ambition. It's what we said in the long-term plan. And the NHS has played a key role over the decades in creating a healthier country, in particular through our vaccination programmes. But here, too, we can continue to build on those strong foundations. There are lots of things we can do and need to make sure we're doing. Last summer, I asked Steve Powis and Chris Whitty to work with local systems and clinical experts to promote those interventions where we know the NHS can make the biggest difference. So interventions like identifying and controlling hypertension, cholesterol and atrial fibrillation, driving uptake of the NHS health check, or giving people help to lose weight, stop smoking, or reduce their alcohol intake. The NHS delivers around two million patient contacts every day. So there is a real opportunity to make every contact count, to offer more people the chance of a healthier future, and to help make the NHS more sustainable. And to do that, we need to forge the right partnerships and pathways between NHS services to make those offers joined up and patient-centred. But as I mentioned earlier, when some challenges subside, others emerge. Smoking is a great example. In 1948, more than eight out of 10 men smoked. Now, it's more like one in eight. For the most part, a success of wider public policy. And also, particularly over the last few years, a success of innovation with the advent of e-cigarettes, encouraging and supporting many former smokers to switch. But with that innovation has come a new challenge, the availability and attractiveness of e-cigarettes to our young people. The report last week from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health of children presenting to hospital with conditions that can be linked to vaping was really worrying. And that is coming through in the figures. Last year, there were 40 admissions uh, of under 20s for vaping relating disorders, and that's up from 11 two years previously. So the RCPCH is right to call for action, and the government is right to be taking those calls seriously. And I'm sure we'll be seeing further steps put forward when its call for evidence on this issue concludes. Of course, look, that's just one example of an area of concern. There are more and bigger ones, particularly obesity and particularly among children. We all know obesity can lead to a string of serious illnesses such as cancer and diabetes, a terrible human cost, but also a real pressure on the NHS. So doing nothing now is not an option. Today, we're announcing 10 more specialist clinics for children and young people suffering complications from obesity, doubling the ambition set out in the NHS long-term plan just four years ago. These new clinics will bring together a range of experts in one place, providing intensive but sensitive physical and mental health support for thousands of young people and their families, helping them lose and keep off weight and therefore reducing their chances of developing more serious conditions. Both of these issues are vivid examples of how the NHS can't create a healthier country on its own. The vast majority of what determines someone's health happens way beyond the reach and remit of the health service. So it's right that colleagues also see a real opportunity in integrated care. Uh, and integrated care systems and integrated care partnerships for the NHS to help drive collective action on the wider determinants of health, working with colleagues in local authority, public health and social care teams, as well as schools, housing associations, employers, the voluntary sector, and many others besides. Because it's only that kind of partnership working locally and nationally that will deliver what we all want to see, which is people living longer, healthier, and happier lives, spending more time at home and less in hospitals. Lastly, the strongest theme that came through in the Assembly's engagement work uh, was the need and the opportunity to support and grow our workforce so it's fit for the future. And doing that is so fundamental to everything I've just talked about, everything the NHS does, uh, that you know, it's, it's first, medium and last in our priorities, isn't it? So I'm hopeful that the long-term workforce plan will be published very soon to address that feedback. We all know the headlines will be about training places and they'll be about new routes and uh, into professions and new roles because they already are before the plan is even published. Uh, and make no mistake, 
Those things are absolutely crucial. A few weeks ago, I had the great pleasure to return to my old secondary school, Durham Johnson uh, Comprehensive, thanks to the NHS 75 Speakers for Schools partnership. And aside for just how smart and articulate the pupils of today are, and I say that as a mother of three, the thing that struck me most was just how many of them were already interested in a career in the NHS. Kids as young as 11, 12, 13, already with at least an inkling that they want to join us in helping those who need it. We can't afford for that wave of enthusiasm to crash against the closed door of insufficient places on medical or nursing courses. Neither can we afford for it to crash against a cliff face of high academic requirements if we can provide an alternative channel into professions for people with the talent and the drive to do those roles. After my visit to my old school, I went to University Hospital of North Durham, and there I met Zoe, Joe, Sophie, and Holly, all of whom were progressing through apprenticeships in both clinical and non-clinical roles. The traditional ways into the NHS didn't work for them for a number of reasons, but with guidance and time and experience. They're being supported to build a career, build a life for themselves, and build the future of the NHS. It was so inspiring to meet them because every step of that progression clearly meant so much to them and they were so excited for where their new careers could take them. So yes, we want to expand training places and yes, we want to bring talented people in through other routes too, including degree level apprenticeships. Our plan will set out how we'll do both those things. It will also set out how we want to keep people at the end of their career engaged in ways that work for them. The experience of the pandemic showed the enormous value of returners in supporting the current workforce. And we've continued to bring staff back through the NHS Reservists programme to respond to surges in demand or emergency situations when they arise. We want to continue to provide routes to return for staff with the skills we need. So as part of that, I can announce today that from this autumn, newly retired doctors will be offered the chance to keep caring and to continue tackling the elective backlog. A new digital platform will allow them to sign up to deliver outpatient appointments, either virtually or in person. Local NHS trusts will be able to upload details of the patients that need to be seen, and they'll be matched with doctors based on their availability and areas of expertise. Creating this new route back has the potential to help us see patients quicker, give regular doctors more time to spend on the most complex cases, and give trusts an alternative to using expensive agency staff. But just as importantly, it gives our most experienced specialists the ability to keep on contributing to the NHS, but in a way that fits far better around their lives. But again, it's important we've got the foundations in place. We can't invest in training and additional routes to bring more people into health service if when they get here, they find the conditions aren't right and they leave. Retention and everything that contributes to it, environment and culture, flexibility, work-life balance, development and career progression must remain a core part of how we grow our workforce. And look, I know I'm not saying anything new. It's what I was talking about last year when I talked about respect for our staff. It's a key driver behind our EDI plan published last week, which made clear that we all bear responsibility for creating a working environment in which all our colleagues want to stay and want to give their best work. And it's a key outcome for the work we're doing to support managers and leaders at every level, building on the findings of the review from Gordon Messenger and Linda Pollard, who reinforced the key role leaders play in creating a positive culture for staff and thereby improving care for patients. So, the underpinning, so that underpinning work, sorry, that, uh, that work on leadership uh, will be central to our workforce plan and that work on retention and how we take it forward. So I'm looking forward to sharing it uh, with you, hopefully, in the coming weeks. So look, those are some of the themes from your response to the Assembly's call for views and my reflections on them. There are more, and I'm really looking forward to seeing their full report soon. But to close today, I want to go back to the beginning. When Bevan brought forward his National Health Service Bill, he did so despite challenge from several quarters. 
Many doctors didn't want to be employees of the state. Many organizations, including charities, churches, and councils, didn't want to lose control of hospitals. Many politicians and commentators, despite the widespread support for the beverage report years earlier, argued their case against on grounds of principle or precedent. But he drove a path through Parliament because he believed in the idea and the value it would bring to individuals and to communities. He passed the bill and he launched the NHS. But that wasn't the end of the matter. By the end of 1948, he felt compelled to send an official memo to his cabinet colleagues. Demand for the new NHS was significantly higher than had first been expected. People were coming forward in their droves, bringing health issues that had previously gone unseen and unaddressed. And there were accusations of excessive administration costs, which just like now, amounted to just 2p in the pound, far lower than our international counterparts. But he persisted. He helped to keep the wheels turning. Determined, of course, to ensure costs didn't jeopardize the new social contract, but stressing in his memo the truly vast benefits to the population as a whole it has involved, and how it had given the people a new freedom from the anxiety in sickness. Just six months later, he had to make the case again. There was disquiet over growing waiting lists. Indeed, much of the rest of his tenure as Minister for Health was typified not by the success of the service he helped to create, but responding to the challenge that success brought. My point is, the history of the NHS is one of challenge. It was there on day one. It's here today on day 27,374, and it will be here tomorrow, next year, and on the 85th birthday too. But what successes too? What life-changing, in many in cases, world-changing successes? Not just creating health, but creating health for everyone. Truly, the most civilized thing a country can do. So if we accept that challenge is part of the job, which we must, we must also accept that part of the job is to make sure those successes are not just for the history books, but there to be bettered, to be built upon, and to benefit as many people as possible. There are so many opportunities ahead of us, and we all have the power, not just to take those opportunities, but to create even more. So just like all those who came before us, let's keep the wheels turning. Let's stay the course. And together, let's drive those improvements in health and care that we all want to see. Thank you. Great questions. Well done. Cracking speech. <laughs> it was like, yeah, we, you needed that, didn't you? You needed it. Get it off your chest. Say it like it is. Um, there's bits of that I thought actually ought to be on ticker tape in every newsroom in the country, you know? Um, so, just to get things started, how, how are you, Amanda? How are you? How are you doing? Of course you can. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I'm... Is it switched on? Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. How are you so, doing? Sli slightly um, discombobulated by the number of people now leaving. <laughs> 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 so, uh, um, but that's fine, that's fine. Uh, how am I? Thank you, Victor. Uh, so, um, well, so look, it's been a pretty full-on couple of years, hasn't it? And I think, you know, in talking about all the things that... Uh, the NHS has achieved and the extraordinary determination and commitment of staff across the NHS at all levels to, to continue that recovery journey. Um, you know, I think it is right to be honest and say it has nonetheless been a pretty challenging yeah. couple of years. We knew it would be. Uh, remember Steve Powers, I think I've talked about this before, saying at the beginning of COVID, you know, it was going to be at least a five-year journey. We're halfway through. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, going back... Uh, just thinking about that sort of uh, you know, double hit from both 
COVID and flu over winter, highest levels of demand ever on the health service. The previous winter was Omicron. We've had industrial action. You know, it's, it's, been, it, it's been pretty nonstop. But mm. how am I, I think, overall still um, really encouraged by both the extraordinary things that have been achieved despite that um, and really determined to continue to work with colleagues to make sure uh, that we do, as I was just saying, uh, continue to take those opportunities uh, to make things better for the future. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's great. I mean, you've been two years now in post, and I'm just wondering, does it, does it feel like two years, two weeks, or 20 years? At times, all of those things yeah. is the honest answer. There are, I mean, there, there, are, there are still lots of people <laughs> leaving, <laughs> which is... <laughs> Uh, clearly for them, it's been 20 years too long already. Um, so, uh, so, no, honestly, what do I think? Uh, I mean, a lot has happened in two years, which probably makes it feel both longer, but equally, uh, I guess the pace at which we work makes it feel like it's, you know, a heartbeat. Mm. Um, my sense, I think, is probably politically, it's been, a, you know, if you look back over history, there's been more change in a fairly short period of time than, than most two-year periods. Uh, and that, I guess, has brought with it both, again, challenge and opportunity. Mm. Um, but I think our job, as I was saying uh, in my remarks, it's, as ever, it's to do both. It's to look at the immediate challenges and respond to what's happening today, the industrial action, I know, mm. on, on a lot of our minds. Uh, but, you know, we have to think beyond that as well. We I have agree. to think the next right. few years, but also we have to think about yeah, the longer time horizon. Yeah. I mean, what do you say to some people, because I get, you know, I get letters, emails in the House of Lords ebook from people in the NHS and people, and they say, this is the worst time ever. I've worked in the NHS for, you know, 50 years or whatever. This is the worst time ever. And I was just wondering, you know, in your speech, it was kind of, actually, it is what it is. Is, is that what you say? And what would you say to those people who are saying, it's, this is the worst? Yeah, we've had all these challenges. This is the worst. And I'm, I'm just wondering what you'd say to those people. Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of, when you, part of the opportunity to look back. It's yeah. Obviously, part of the opportunity is to celebrate an extraordinary legacy yeah. of, of 75 years of the NHS. Uh, but it is also to say, you know, there has been enormous pressure at periods through the NHS's history. In fact, you can kind of pick any year and there would be a set of things that were hugely pressured. But there have been certain periods that have no doubt been massively challenging mm. for the NHS. And we are in another one. Yeah. OK, BAU. It's, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, it's our, you know, it, you, ca you, you can't, you know, I, wouldn't we all love it if we hadn't had a pandemic? But you, you can't control those things. No. But what we can control is how we respond to that. And I think that's the, that's, I, I guess, what I see everybody doing is, uh, is collectively trying to focus on, as ever, you know, making things uh, as good as they possibly can be for patients, supporting yeah. staff, getting on with the job. The, the establishment of, of um, ICS's, you know, place emphasis on sort of distributing leadership, if that's the right word, um, shift from central control, uh, more local autonomy, uh, and with a year into ICS's. And I'm just, how do you feel it's going? How do you, you know, how do you feel it's going? What are your, what's your vision for the future of that, that work? Yeah, I mean, look, you've, you've, you've said it's the most important point, which is, both we are only a year into ICSs, but actually we are a year in. Mm. So, you know, they're not theoretical anymore, they're real. Um, and I think we can see already really concrete examples of a different way of working and how that is benefiting, uh, not just uh, in very sort of specific ways around recovery, which I've talked about, but actually much more broadly, the engagement around with, with lo deep engagement with local communities and with partners around things like the prevention agenda, the wider, uh, the wider health and care agenda. And, you know, it is, is palpable. Mm -hmm. And I think the work we're doing on the operating model, you know, done, as you said, you know, we've, we've done quite a lot on it. We need to keep working at it, keep iterating it, because as ICSs grow and as they grow in confidence and maturity and as, uh, as, you know, as we all learn to work in a different way as a consequence, we will want to keep, uh, keep moving on that journey. What do you, what do you, does this notion of earned autonomy, um, I mean, oh, man, could you say a bit more about what that means in practice? What, what, 
What yeah, does I good look like? Not, it's not quite the right phrase, is it? Because it feels a bit like we're using yesterday's language for today for today's yeah. ways of working. It's but there the is definitely I know, no, and I and I've said that. And like every time I say it, I said, I know that's not quite the right word, but I can't think of a better one at the moment. Uh, but I think there is something for me about, you know, you look across the NHS, there's mm. enormous variation. Yeah. And one of the things we obviously collectively are trying to do is make sure both we're, we're spreading and supporting the best. And, you know, I've talked in my speech about some of the amazing innovations that are happening and some of the fantastic opportunities that we'd love everyone to benefit from, things like the improvement approach designed to help with that. Um, equally, we've got some places that are really challenged and are struggling and we need to make sure we're giving more intensive support uh, in the right ways. ICSs are you know, similar. We've got some examples of really mature you know, really uh, well-established systems. We don't want to be in a situation where we're holding them back. Mm. We want them to be free to fly mm. and to continue to innovate and, and show us the way. Equally, we don't want to be in a situation where for others where, you know, in particular, uh, that, that there are different, you know, different local circumstances at play mm. where we're not leaning in and supporting mm. the right way. So I think it's a bit about how do we together collectively, because this isn't about us doing it on our own, but how do we start to develop our thinking mm. about what uh, that more sophisticated relationship will need yeah. to be, uh, recognising that variation exists. Does it change the kind of leaders, leadership that you expect from everyone in the NHS, I guess, not least NHS England? Does it change the, the way they behave? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, we've tried to set it out. I, I know this is, this, is, this is one of those things that I get more excited about than other people, but no, the, operating model, <laughs> the operating model, the operating model document. Pretty good. I, did, I think I said this last year at the conference, where I, I said I'd spoken to a room of people about the operating model and said, and who's read it? And literally no one. <laughs> We all read it before a roaring fire, <laughs> but, right? um, but But now I'm sure it's very different. Yeah. Uh, but that describes, as, as one of the, the visuals at the end, which I, th I hope is helpful, a kind of range of what we kind of call ways that we deliver value into mm. the NHS. One of them is about accountability mm. and performance and data, but there are lots of others and they're everything from you know how do we provide certain services centrally so just shout out to my commercial mm. colleagues and digital colleagues you know keep things like the digital spine running every day mm. uh, benefits all of us but there's also things like improvement uh, innovation it's how we do uh, resource management and allocation it's how we do uh, things like talent management and the things that we're doing on workforce and i guess what i asking my own organization to do is make sure that we are really thoughtful about all of those different things yeah. that we do and we are increasingly being uh, again really intentional about yeah. which of those you use in different circumstances yeah. Yeah. so it's not about saying there's you know going to be a world where we don't have and i know patricia was really clear about this in her review a situation where there isn't an accountability arrangement where there isn't a performance arrangement of course not uh, we'll Far too much public money is spent by all of us for that ever to be appropriate. But it is about saying, I think, actually, as we develop the operating model, we're mm. going to be looking for leaders who are able to use those different ways yeah, yeah. of working in an appropriate way. Would you use the term systems leadership? I, I'm increasingly, absolutely. And talking to colleagues, I mean, you will all probably reflect this back in your own roles. Um, you know, I think sort of gone are the days where at senior level you are ever able just to have... Uh, you know, in a sense, the luxury of thinking just about a single organisation, you will always be thinking about partnership mm. and be thinking about a both and, both how you're doing uh, the, the sort of day job bit, if you like, but the, increasingly the day job is the and as well, yeah, yeah. which is being a really good partner and working out uh, how to be a great system leader as well as an organisational leader. Uh, Richard talked in his speech about the task, the internal task that you're going through at the moment, which is remodelling um, NHS England. And, and I guess I just, I'd be interested in how you feel it's going and when do you feel the end point might be. It's always uncertain, I know that, because, you know, it's difficult for those people, as Richard said, that are working for the organisation. Yeah. But I'm just curious about how you feel it's going and where do you think the end point is in time and, you know. Yeah, thank you. I mean, and it gives me an opportunity, and some of my colleagues are here, uh, are here today, merging five organisations, yeah, no which is what we've been trying to do, whilst also taking out sort of significant uh, headcount in, in order to remodel an organisation in response yeah. to the fact that we have ICSs and we want to work differently and we know that's really important and to be as effective as possible as a, as a central organisation. It is really hard. Mm. Not, it's hard for me, nothing compared to how hard it is for my colleagues mm. who are going through it. Mm. So um, I really 
aware that actually we don't talk about it very much because I guess you know we're mostly talking about the NHS and what we're doing to serve the NHS and, and, and to fulfill our leadership responsibilities and roles but actually it does thank you give me the opportunity to say thank you to my colleagues in NHS England Health, Ed Health Education England, NHS Digital, uh, for their continued extraordinary commitment to their roles, despite going through mm. what is a hugely, uh, it, you know, a hugely disruptive change process. Mm. When do you think? What's the end? Do you, do you have an end date in mind? Do, do you have a sort of conclusion? Yeah, we've we've actually just, I think, announced a revised timetable to get through uh, by the end of this year all of the changes. Um, but it's it's really important. <laughs> that whilst we move as quickly as we possible we'll do, it, it do, we've got to do it properly yeah. and we've got to make sure, I mean actually one of the great things about our internal uh, process is how many people have responded to the consultations mm. that we've been doing internally mm. and actually a consultation has got to mean that so you've got yeah. to change what you're planning to do in response yeah. to feedback so giving enough time to make sure the process mm. has been able to do that has been important. And when you think about the endpoint and uh, the kind of organisation that Richard described and you've just in charge of processing what do you think it's unique because you talked about the sort of ecosystem that we're now in I guess yeah. what what what's the unique contribution of NHS England or what will it be when you've finished the sort of remodeling as it were what, what? refer you back to the operating model Victor <laughs> where we've set that out very clearly um, I mean the thing that's really uh, the thing that's really exciting about coming together as five of course is what we get now is the opportunity and I talked about it a lot in my speech but that centrality of workforce but also this massive opportunity we've got with digital mm. data tech. Now by having NHS Digital and HEE together as part of the, the central organization, single organization, we can sort of put our money where our mouth is and actually mm. not just talk about those things, but then they're over there, yeah, actually. Yeah. They're now all part of us. So you know, if you think about what NHS Digital used to do, I talked about things like lives, you know, they, they run our live services. You know, mm. it's not just about the development, mm. uh, the development side or the innovation side, although that's also a hugely important part of yeah. what they do. Similarly, Health Education England, you know, they are actually, they buy training places, <laughs> obviously, depending on what's funded. Uh, but, you know, they are a, a huge education provider. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I think we've now got is a, is a real opportunity with that yeah. expertise as well as those functions uh, to offer something that hopefully hopefully uh, will be felt by colleagues across the NHS as a much more coherent and therefore much more constructive and, and, and helpful uh, combined way of doing things which in the past were done perhaps slightly slightly more separately. Now, I'm, supposed, I'm supposed I was told we're going to have some Slido questions but while they're coming on I just want to ask you something because I'm bound to ask us I'm, I'm the chair of the CONFED and it's CONFED NHS England conference and all that. How can, how can my organisation help you? How can we work together? You've got, you know, we're the largest representative body of healthcare leaders in the UK. We've got Wales, Northern Ireland. How can we, how can we build this together? Because, you know, we, nobody, no organisation can do it on its own. How can we help? Um, I, feel, I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like that's, uh, uh, that, that I've just been, that's what I can just bat out of the park, can't I? Because you're absolutely right, we do so much in partnership already, um, and not just with Confed, I should say. Of course, we have lots of other uh, fantastically important uh, and, really, uh, and really good stakeholder partners, um, whether that's uh, NHS providers, uh, who uh, are also, um, I know, represented uh, here in force, but also uh, a number of others across social care, across the LGA, across uh, you know, professional groups, royal colleges, etc. So, I mean, there is a, if you looked at my diary, you'd find a significant amount of time spent very much with partners outside the NHS, because partly it's a, uh, a fantastic opportunity for us to make sure we're always hearing multiple perspectives. I mean, mm. it's really important that you don't become an echo chamber. Uh, so that's why it's great to be here listening to and talking to colleagues from across the NHS, of course, as well. Um, that's why I do so many visits and get out and about and, yeah. and spend time on the front line. But listening to those voices uh, that can often see things just in a very different but very illuminating way. But as you say, also in all of the cases I've just described in Confed very much so, it's because ultimately we all want the same things. Mm. So it's actually you, you know, using those different mm. strengths, those different uh, skills, those different networks to help us think out different ways of approaching problems, different ways of taking opportunities. Uh, so it's been great partnering with Confed, for example, particularly on some of the IC, SICB development, yeah. where I think uh, there's been a, a, a hugely important piece of work that Confed continue to do to develop leadership, to develop the thinking, to develop the operating model. Okay, great. I've got to ask you this, and it's always um, 
um, because people think I'm asking you this because I'm a six-foot black guy, but I'm not. I'm asking you it because 25% of the NHS workforce look of various shades of me, <laughs> and 50% yeah. um, of nurses in London, you know, it's a significant issue. And you've just launched the EDI plan, yeah. which I mentioned. And I just, um, the saying, we're out of time, please wrap up. <laughs> She's the chief exec. <laughs> Got to have a couple of words, right? Two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Is that all right? Can we do that? Okay, it so depends the what question. the questions are, doesn't well, it? Well, yeah, it, well, it could be really short. You could say, I've had enough of this yeah, and walk off. Um, yeah, but I feel I need to ask you it, right? So the EDI plan is a, is a plan. It's there. It's good. You know, we said it. In Wales, they have launched an anti-racism strategy. And I, I wonder what you think about that. So in Wales, they've got an, NH, an anti a clear anti-racist strategy. That's what they talk about. And it's evidence-based. We have an EDI strategy, and I'm just I'm curious about what you make of that, that difference, that contrast. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting point, Victor, thank you, because I think we've debated quite a lot the, the importance of race, but in the context of the importance of all of the other protected characteristics that we talk about in the EDI plan as well, and whether or not it was right to single out any one area for particular focus. So in developing the EDI plan, which again, my thanks to Naveena Evans, who's our uh, Chief Workforce Training and Education um, Officer, uh, but also has led this work personally, huge amount of engagement and huge amount of involvement and support again from a lot of, in fact, the RHO has been, been, been really helpful in helping us think, uh, think about how to develop it. But I think a lot of the work Naveena's done, a lot of what she's heard back, has been about the importance of us trying to do something that was, that was really, really clear about the I, so the inclusive. Mm. Um, certainly, I know I've said it before, but one of the areas that I worry about um, is disability. Mm. And if you look at the people, number of people who declare disabilities, it's lower than it should be. So, you know, we're not getting that quite right. And it's equally something that I know other people will have different, uh, you know, different things that they probably worry about, particularly locally. But race is hugely important. And we shouldn't shy away from it. We shouldn't shy away from talking about it. We shouldn't shy away from trying to be really intentional about our actions. And what the EDI plan, if people haven't had a chance to look at it, it's intended to be practical, challenging. It's about personal responsibility for this, not about, you know, it, it, not about having action plans, but what are we individually going to do about it? But it's also intended to be evidence-based and focusing on the things that we know make a difference. Mm. Last question, yeah. right? Last question, because you've been very generous with your time. Very, very generous with your time. You're as cool as crisps. Go ask you the question. Um, I talked about difficult conversations in this, this meeting. What are the difficult conversations you'd like us to have here? Because you talked about work. It's great. That's, that's what we want to do. What are the difficult conversations that we should be having here in this space over the next day or so? When are the, when are the diff, what are the difficult ones? Things that make us feel uncomfortable that we need to talk about? Well, I think there's probably... So, I mean, look, people will want to talk about whatever, I guess, is top, top of their minds on, on this. But I would say uh, there are probably three things that I would say. Um, difficult conversations... There is a really important set of conversations about the how. Mm. So actually, uh, extraordinary success, extraordinary effort yeah. over the last couple of years. Correct. How are we going to keep doing this? Mm. Um, and how are we going to keep doing this in the context of, you know, we've had a winter like the one we've just had. We've had industrial action. We don't know what's coming next, but it, but it, it might be as bad. You know, but actually, if we want to continue to serve for our patients, if we want to continue to get up every day and make a difference, how are we going to keep doing that? <laughs> Second difficult conversation, I think, you know, I've said it in my speech a moment ago, we equally need to think beyond the, beyond the tomorrow yeah. and beyond the next year. And actually, there are some real choices if we think about the sort of 10-year horizon, 15-year horizon. You know, how much are we really uh, going to try and focus on prevention? Mm. How much does that mean as the NHS, we need to think about our role in partnership. So that might not be leading the partnership. That yeah. might be yeah. uh, being members of, in fact, being led by others yeah. in partnership. Um, how much are we going to be, you know, really focus on primary care, community yeah. care, that getting, uh, yeah. getting, getting care out of hospitals? Uh, but how are we going to do that in the context of also making sure our specialist services and our acute side doesn't mm. fall, don't fall over? So some really, I think, difficult things to think mm. through for the long term. My third is culture. Mm -hmm. 
because we talked about the workforce plan and retention being such an important part of it as well as new staff and all of the things I talked about we all know but actually we are again in a context where we've got uh, really great examples from the retention program mm. about things starting to make a difference mm. how are we going to make that happen everywhere Brilliant. because again if we really want to keep people if we really want to be in a situation where we can make the most of our extraordinary talented colleagues uh, then i think it's on us to think about how we make uh, the make the nhs everywhere a place people want to work amanda fritcher can i thank you for your leadership can i do that um can i thank you for your time well yeah I'm, i could not but i'm <laughs> I thought, I thought I would, because I mean it, because I mean it. Thank you for your leadership. We all get a bit shy, don't we, thank you, leadership. But thank you for your leadership. Um, please thank Amanda for her time and her contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you.